I appreciate events like this because it's an opportunity to show you just how much foods that you didn't think go together actually go together. And it's really not that different than music, which I think it's like very fitting that somebody like, you know, Quest Love is actually the one putting an event like this on because, you know, he spent 30, 40 years of his life finding the music that you thought didn't go together that goes together. I look for chefs that are you know that are just really really creative and those who just have a passion for storytelling and for experiments i'm gonna share a little secret with you which is i was a terrible cook growing up um terrible terrible the first thing i ever really like cooked somehow even with an electric cooktop i managed to start a grease fire and there were literally flames shooting up to the ceiling. And I, in my panic, didn't attempt to put out the fire or address it anyway. I literally just ran out the back door to grab my mom to like come and save me. And I didn't really cook for a while after that until I was probably like in my late teens or early 20s. My mother taught me how to cook at a very young age as a means of survival because she had to work. That did not instill a love of food for me because it was a chore. And I didn't really fall in love with food until uh, it became my profession at the age of 21. I was selling drugs and found, like, stumbled into this job. And I felt like being a chef was going to help define my direction. So tonight um, we have what's called a turkey terrine or a pâté en croûte, which is a French style of creating basically a fancy meatloaf that's wrapped in really fancy bread um, made from a hot water crust and a sweet potato, mustardo, and butter. And the other thing that we've prepared for the vegans and the vegetarians is eggplant confit. It's been confit in coconut oil with turmeric and it gets a hazelnut gravy. The eggplant dish is a, a dish that my wife and I made over the summer to honor John Coltrane and Alice Coltrane. He was a vegan at the end of his life, and we read about a bunch of different things that he would eat. Small leaves of lettuce and hazelnuts and eggplant. The way that we try to work is we really emphasize uh, the foundations and, and structures of black food ways, and sweet potato is quintessential. It's also the time of year um, for us to be eating sweet potatoes, and so because we work in the restaurant industry, um, it is Thanksgiving season. We already had turkey. <laughs> um, and we, we decided to use it and make something nice and elegant for the first course. A little more opulent than I would say things that we typically do for first courses. And yeah, we just always try to pay respect to our ancestors and, and show off our, our technique. We have this ability to be able to like just kind of talk about ingredients and taste things in our head. So we knew what it was going to be like as soon as we cooked it and, and plated it. And so it just... It was like immaculate conception. <laughs> We're calling it a lobster royale chuchi. And it's based on um, a Thai dish called chuchi, which is traditionally made with seafood. It's a red curry based, um, really heavy on magroot lime leaves. And instead of doing straight lobster, we've done a lobster custard with reduced lobster stock. Um, little lobster meat and chuchi sauce, just keeping it simple, little coconut milk with some rice. Well, we both uh, enjoy the theatrics of a fun event or a fun dinner service. So I think we appreciate all the little kind of details and components, the smells, you know, the, the interaction, I think all of it. I have a thing for old, you know, like vintage French style and applying that to Thai food, which, you know, is a little bit different and combining those two elements together I think is something that we've done you know at our restaurants. The old and the new. The old and the new, yeah. Yeah. Everyone in my family cooked. Uh, they were all street vendors. My grandmother had a farm 
and she would sell vegetables at the market and all the kids basically raised themselves by selling food. And family is a big influence on what we're, you know, what we're currently doing and they're food obsessed, which is great for us, you know, so it's, they're always, you know, telling us different little secrets or different uh, ingredients or a place to go try. One thing I took away from them a lot was they're very freewheeling, so they'll, they'll see things, they'll make it happen. It's not about cooking to a recipe, it's about just making it happen with what's there and a lot of times things end up being better. Just being open-minded and, and taking it in is, is the key, you know, never staying stagnant. My mom's, my mom's famous for, we'll be at work, she'll try something, and then we'll come home from work. And she went to Chinatown, bought all of the same ingredients. She's making the dish at home just to show us that she can make it better, you know? And, and we'll never let her know that it's better, even if it is, like, but yeah. I love standing in the corner of the restaurant and watching people take those first couple of bites because they're, it's very telling. You can tell right away how they're feeling about the food, and I think is very useful. Yeah, and it's very genuine too. Yeah. More so than asking a friend, "Hey, what'd you think?" Or yeah. you know, it's it's you see it. People, you know, it's very it's very it's a very honest mm -hmm. assessment yeah. of, of a dish or a new you know component. Mm -hmm. As an artist, if if you're painting a painting, you want people to admire your painting or at, at least find them considering and thinking about your painting. And for me, um, it's not just about the delight; it's about the the indulgence, the you know, the act of eating. I don't love watching people eat my food. I don't know, I think I'm a little too self-critical to like enjoy that process. Um, Cause I'm just thinking about like, oh, I I'll do it better this way next time or I'll tweak this next time. And it's that drive, that, that dissatisfaction that kind of constantly pushes me forward that also kind of hinders me from enjoying the process. I'm working on that. Yes, I love watching them eating the food, but more than that, it's the emotions which run through them. That's what excites me. You know, there'll be people who'll come to us and say that, you know, this reminded them of eating this food in India. And that is something which touches your heart, you know, because that's what you're cooking for, right? That's what you want from people. So what I've made tonight is a dish from uh, Dhamaka, but also added few more elements to it. So we have a goat belly seek. So there's a specific kind of a goat belly that we source, which is high fat content. And then it is minced as a mixture. And then it's rolled in cedar wood. And then it's baked. So obviously we normally grill it in the restaurant. Unfortunately, I don't have the grill over here. So I'm going to bake that and then going to burn it up a little bit. And it's served with saffron rice and some korma sauce. I think this dish is very close to me because as a kid growing up, I used to love the Sikh kebabs and this is a Sikh kebab. And everything that I do in my restaurants is a lot is attached to my memories and what I love to eat as a kid or growing up. So the entire food revolves around it. And so this dish is my favorite dish at the restaurant. So whenever I'm hungry and I want to eat something at Dhamaka, it's always good belly seek. Food is a universal language. A lot of our team members uh, front of the house are not Indian. But a lot of them have learned about Indian food. And I think what also happens is that culturally we exchange things. You know, food is a very uh, common denomination and a universal language which just binds everybody together, I feel. Food is sort of like this great equalizer. Like, first of all, everybody needs to eat. There is the ritual of it. Obviously, like, delicious food is, it promotes, like, good feelings and happiness and all these things. And everybody needs to eat and, and, it is a way that you care about people. It's a way that you love people. And that's definitely like part of my DNA. So tonight I've prepared like a riff on sweet potato pie. It's fully plant-based, it's vegan, it's... Should I tell you all the details or do, do we wait? I'll tell you all the details. Okay, it'll just be between us. So it's a spiced sweet potato puree with coconut milk and habanero and some warming spices. There is a black pepper and clove pie piece, pie pieces that go on top, a plant-based marshmallow meringue. And what else? Oh, there's a balvany caramel sauce that goes on top. I've got some hot pecans that are gilded, so like a lovely gold moment, and marigolds, of course, on top to finish. I just made a film. 
I was down south with my uncle, who's a farmer, who supports his community through farming. And one of the big pieces of produce that we focused on was sweet potatoes. And sweet potato pie during the holidays is like part of my heritage and my culture. And for me, being able to create things that are plant-based, that are gluten-free. I've been gluten-free for 20 years and there's sort of a whole swath of things I can't have. And as I've gone through my career, I've worked with populations of people who can't have this and can't have that and there's all these restrictions. And so for me, it's all about reworking the classics so that everyone can have you know, this experience together. It's really, really, really about inclusivity and choices. And that's where I went. I wanted it to be spicy and not just sweet, 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 which sometimes sweet potato pie can be. And I just wanted it to be something really beautiful, something elegant, something exciting. And that's, that was the inspiration for the dish. I'm racking my brain right now about how that sweet potato pie dessert was made. So, you know, if I look a little weird right now, it's only because there's a, a thought cloud in my head, like, how the hell did she do that? <laughs> I think food is life for us. It's, it's, it's as important as the oxygen. Food is the very thing that brings civilizations together. It's like a catalyst that joins everybody together. It's the lifeblood, really, of everything inside of my community. It's the best when you see like a dining room and people are actually sharing with their neighbors and really getting into the food, then that's, that's great. Food is a social adhesive. Um, it's literally what brings people together. Food is often our first introduction into cultures that we don't know anything about. And there are a lot of places that you might not go. There are a lot of people that you walk past who you may not talk to on the street. But if you know their food, then intrinsically you know them. And within that, I believe food is one of the most beautiful connectors in the world, right next to music. When we first come into this world, um, the first things that, how you're ever cared for is somebody holds you and somebody feeds you, you know? Um, and hopefully when you go out, somebody holds you and somebody feeds, like, that's how, you know, that's, that's how we start and that's how we finish. There's nothing more important in our society, I think, than food. It's, it is the great human connector, and it's the, it's the thing that connects us more broadly to the universe at large. Mm -hmm.